This episode of Important If True is brought to you by Quip. Electric toothbrushes sent to your home with brush head refills every three months. And if you go to tryquip.com slash thumbs, you will receive your first brush head refill absolutely free. That is tryquip.com slash thumbs. I'm brushing my teeth right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we have a Nothing. sexual oh. crayfish. <laughs> we thought we had a sexual crayfish. We got something. <laughs> Jake is really excited right now. I am not. I, this is me. This is me, Chris. Just get used to it. This is the new me. Okay. An exhausted. Every week we've got a new you to look forward to. What? It's March 30th, 2018. And this is important if true. For Idle Thumbs, I am Chris Remo. I'm Nick Brecken. I'm Jake Rodkin. Hey, guys. Hello. Hey. hey. Welcome. I feel welcome, Chris. I feel welcome from, from the warm tones of your voice saying welcome. I'm glad you didn't characterize them as dulcet, which mm. I feel is an oh, overused descriptor of tones. I think that it's only ever used at this point to describe tones, nothing else. Exactly. That's, That's the problem. Yeah. 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 It's not. the prob- Just people should just stop using it. Because this seems like the sort of thing where like you could get internet excited about like let's start using it to describe other things. <laughs> no, <laughs> incorrect. You should I don't, not. I don't want anyone to get excited about it. That's I the just, exact sort of shit I that just people think, get excited about, though. I just think that you if know s- that it's true. And this is important if true. <laughs> no, we're fine. <laughs> anyway, I mean, how do my tones sound? If someone were to start describing, not so, okay, not start because I take your point. But I mean, if I was just in a conversation with someone and they offhandedly mentioned their sort of dulcet down pillow, I have, for the record, I have no idea if that's an appropriate usage of dulcet, but I would Oh, it is. They advertise on this podcast, dulcet down pillows. <laughs> Dulcet.com <laughs> slash Dulcet thumbs. down pillows. Great. <laughs> my aristocratic great, great grand <laughs> of the, Yes. <laughs> Of the of the Virginia down pillows. Yeah. <laughs> now that we've wrapped up that particularly worthless nothing, uh, we have an email from Bo, who writes, "Howdy there, gents." From Bo, who writes. Bo, who writes. That's another. Sorry. Howdy there, gents. I have a nasty problem. I need help with desperately. How do you get glitter out of carpet, clothes, and everything? My fiance and I were sending wedding invitations and she wanted to use glitter as a nice extra touch. I wanted to help out so she didn't have to do everything. You can already tell this is where things are going to go wrong. I despise and have an irrational fear of glitter spawning from my sister when we were kids. With this in mind, I was trying to power through getting the glitter on the invitations and making sure it doesn't turn into a glitter bomb for all receiving them. Me being me, I dropped the big ass tub of glitter in the middle of my apartment. Now there's glitter everywhere, and I mean oh, everywhere. No. Once the gold glitter hit the floor, it turned into an explosion that coated everything. Uh, oh, I cleaned up the initial dump, but I still find it everywhere in my life. I am going insane. I have cleaned and swept my place, washed clothes numerous times, and nothing seems to work. This has been a month since the self-induced glitter bomb happened. A month of hell. Please, any help from y'all would be greatly appreciated. I am slowly going insane from the gold glitter flakes that have infested my life. Thanks tons, Bo from Ohio. Thanks tons of glitter. Uh, Bo, I, I have some advice. Before we get into the physical properties of the glitter and the glitter bomb that you unleashed in this apartment, which I think is probably where the where the meat of this question <laughs> lies, but first, um, I think that we can solve this by looking at some, some verbiage choices here. I offered to help my fiancé, yeah. was followed immediately by, so I powered through. <laughs> <laughs> just I think that might be where the problem was like I can help actually I hate this and I'm gonna do a really f- just smash and grab job on this yeah oh oops hoisted like uh, <laughs> I, I I I yes like, I, I sympathize but that's, that's oh totally <laughs> I I actually honed in on it home Dan I should say um, one of those there's a little tip for you you don't hone in on something Mm-hmm. Uh, you could hone it though. You could you could hone your you email hone it. Uh, I could comprehension hone skills my reply <laughs> to this email Bo could hone his uh, patience, uh, his, his glitter His glitter handling word talk this week on Important <laughs> True. <laughs> hone your dulcet tones yeah. on oh. Important If True. Uh. 
Call it the hone zone. Welcome. <laughs> I I will not. <laughs> yeah, I refuse. we can home in on a better title. <laughs> we can definitely home in on a better title. We can also hone, hone a better. So what were you title. homing in we? on, Chris? Um, well, I was <laughs> no, we shouldn't. We should explicitly not talk about anything <laughs> related to this again, and just except what you were homing in on. Mm-hmm. I I was homing in on the uh, the passage here in which Bo says that he wanted to make sure it doesn't turn into a glitter bomb for all of the recipients. And I just imagined just around the corner of one of the rooms in his home, a, a self-satisfied pod. genie oh, sort okay. of grinning and nodding and saying, ah, yes, ah, indeed. None of your recipients, recipients will re- receive a <laughs> glitter bomb. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> wish uh, granted. Wish granted, yeah. You, fo- you were focused. You know, you know what happens when you, when you focus too much uh, on the secondary. Um, well, you, just if you're worried about the, the the minute specifics of an outcome, yes, uh, they will be met precisely. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you miss the glitter forest uh, for the trees here in the hone zone. Um, I I totally relate. I mean, on a, just on a minor level, I totally relate to this um, because even the seemingly tiniest amount of glitter is essentially infinite. Um, My wife bought me a very nice anniversary card like a month ago. I remember noticing days earlier that there were just like some little bits of glitter on my nightstand. And I just, I kept noticing it. I didn't say anything. I didn't like make anything of it. But your but eyes kept yeah, looking would, at it and you're I like, what the fuck is that? I clean them up. And then <laughs> like, the that? next night I would just notice just more specks of stuff on my fingers or, mm-hmm. you know, the area or whatever. And then eventually I received the card and I was like, oh, that's, that's what this is. And that was just <laughs> a single lightly dusted greeting cards, you know, worth of this substance. I can't even begin to imagine an entire gold bag of glitter exploding into our apartment. That is essentially a pocket universe. You know when people say things like, um, you know, oh, the number of grains of... I don't know what the hell people say about anything about atoms or the universe, but you know when people say things about like, oh, the when the the guy uh, has the chessboard and he tricks the king into giving him one grain of rice... He's like, okay, king, pay me this paltry sum of a grain. <laughs> okay, fuck. There's a there's a parable. This relates to an email that we're gonna read later. Actually, Maybe, this is a good segue. No, what, say- <laughs> what I'm saying is, do you guys know what I'm talking about, right? He's like, yeah. I've solved this pol- problem for you, and all you have to do is take a chessboard and put one grain of rice on the first square, and then on the next square, double the grains of rice, and then on the third square, double that many grains of rice, yes. and then that is my payment, is this grains of rice. And then if you do it, it's like more than and the And then atoms the king is like, fuck, the there's fucking- glitter everywhere now. <laughs> <laughs> How did you do that? And then he, he flourishes his cape and disappears with like a shitload of rice. With, in a puff of glitter. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> then, oh, <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> um, yeah. And it's always... Uh, People often use that kind of um, geometric or uh, exponential uh, increase to sort of just show the power of, you know, compounding or or whatever. Um, And then often it comes with some kind of sort of amazing fact that seems impossible to believe. Like this is more than all the grains of sand on the planet or like atoms in the universe or some fucking crazy shit like that. I don't know. It's probably not the latter one that seems implausible, but maybe not. I've definitely seen, I should have looked this up, but I've definitely seen people claim that some seemingly mundane thing when multiplied enough, eventually. Mm. Like the quality of wine, for instance. Right. Yeah. Like the quality of wine. You need, you need, there's just cameras filming Bo's apartment in slow motion as the glitter bomb explodes and then David Attenborough shows up and says uh, he will die alone first he delivers some fa- sorry I jumped the gun on that first he says there's more glitter in this apartment than there are <laughs> atoms some in atoms universe. in the universe and then, and then he says yeah unable to find a mate Bo <laughs> Bo will die alone left by his, right. yep. his 
that's not helping him at all, really. No, no. the real, the real solution. Fiance is now going to leave him because of this mess he's made. No, well, the also, real way to fix this. Oh, Nick, go ahead. Well, you no, I mean, his fiance is also going to assume for the rest of her life that she's about to get like a card or a present or something from him. <laughs> There's going to be glitter in that apartment forever. <laughs> oh, oh, did Bo it get just, me? Yeah. Oh, oh, oh like, oh, something oh, special must be coming. Yeah. <laughs> oh, 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 no, it was just left over oh, glitter. Oh, 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 oh. I mean, that doesn't speak very highly of her. Maybe she needs to hone her deductive reasoning skills. Well, maybe she's preoccupied, preoccupied maybe, by homing in on where this gift is hidden in the house. Maybe mm. Bo's tones are so dulcet that she's always expecting <laughs> something kind to occur. Uh, Bo is honing his tones. Mm-hmm, Bo's honed tones here in the hone zone. <laughs> uh, my actual solution, Bo, for how to clean this glitter by up. By the way, I should be clear, this is all happening in Bo's home. <laughs> 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 anyway, what is your actual solution? Leave this apartment. Get a new apartment. <laughs> That's really Burn it to the ground. Take all of your furniture yeah. outside and like rent an industrial gl- grade leaf blower and get yeah. all the fucking glitter off of it as much as you can. Figure out a way to hide the glitter that's in your apartment for the inspection, or just kiss that deposit goodbye <laughs> then, and get out while you can. Then start. Then start maintaining uh, a long distance postcard based mm. insidious campaign at the new tenants of your current apartment where you imply that maybe there's sort of glitter that they might notice out of the corner of their eye and who knows what that glitter could could be what oh, that right. could portend <laughs> send them some cards that you that you put a little like dust of a little gold glitter so when right. they move into the apartment they're like that's where it is but <laughs> assemble those cards in your current apartment before moving because I know Bo uh, from the only point of data that I have about you that if you try <laughs> to put glitter on a card up. you're yeah. gonna mess up your apartment yeah. so yep. do that before you no, move no it's true yeah use this already ruined apartment as your staging ground yeah yeah Actually, alternate plan, buy some uh, spray adhesive and just gold glitter the shit out of every surface <laughs> in your apartment. Just go just go nuts. So get that leaf blower that I was talking about, but fill it full of gold <laughs> glitter, and then first spray adhesive every wall, and then just gun blast. And then just, just do it. Just, just, you, d- just use your skills. <laughs> yeah, you know you're good at one you thing. Know, you know what to do. <laughs> I mean, that's that's a good one. That's a like <clears throat> lemons into lemonade situation. Yeah. I yeah. like that. Yeah. So are you suggesting he lives in that or are you suggesting that's his final act before I'm suggesting move out? well it depends on what you think of the outcome. What, what do you what do you think the There's walk gonna, the fucking <laughs> landlord walk through <laughs> that's going to be like <laughs> Yeah, I think oh, the previous well, tenant left it like this. I don't think we're going to give your security deposits coming back. I don't know, Chris. Remains to be seen. I think but. there's a curve. I think that... <laughs> I don't know what the other ends of the curve are. There might just be an arc. Uh, there's, a, there's a really... It's, it is. It's like, it's like an... Uh, it's a really steep curve that up towards the top is the the <laughs> landlord or property manager coming in and just going, oh, my God. Actually, Mother it's the arc God. of them saying, oh, my God, right? right. The, oh, my God. Oh, oh my God. God. Or just, oh, 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 my God. Oh, my God. And that's where you're like, you're paying me to take this apartment back. <laughs> <laughs> that's and when the, you get married in that apartment, and right. then you turn it into a successful lo- chapel. Chapel, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, you, you, you're either selling it back to them uh, – for an amazing, amazing gain, even though you previously were renting it, or you're forced legally to buy the, the unit off of them uh, because it's unrentable. <laughs> Hopefully in the call that you have to schedule the walkout and to put in your notice for move out of the apartment, your landlord is like, oh, so don't forget, you know, make sure to to clean up the apartment and sort of do, do you know, get it back in working order and everything, set it all up. You're like, oh, don't worry. I've gone over every inch of the apartment and say it really suggestively. And they're like, oh, okay, good. Glad to hear that. Yes, you'll find this apartment will be sparkling when you arrive. I would consider it to be in golden condition. And they're like, yeah, did you did you put glitter everywhere? Because the notice that you sent saying you're moving out, like it had a bunch of glitter on it. And it, it's really fucking it up my desk. Like it's everywhere in sure here I know now. exactly what happened. Yeah. Bo. Bo. I listened to Important If True. Yeah, I, I'm going to go back to just move out, though. I think you pretty much have to move out. I genuinely, I've, like, given my experiences with glitter, I, I'm i pretty sure. You're going to move out, and your new apartment is still going to have, like, 70 it pieces of will. glitter in it. It yeah. absolutely it will, yes. It. it will be so secreted. move, like, three times over the next two years, and you might mm-hmm. get rid of, like, mm-hmm. 90% of the glitter. Yeah, this is the opposite, though, from the... Um, God, I think about this so often. This is the opposite of the sort of Adam's 
in the universe thing. It's the other one of like you can never get rid of stuff because there's always going to be at least one particle mm-hmm. of. Oh the right, where thing. you you've gotten rid of fifty percent of the glitter, fifty percent of the glitter, fifty percent of the glitter. Exactly, Eventually, that yeah. averages down. To there's at least one stupid gold fleck that follows yep. you until you die. Yep, yep. You're never getting rid of it, Bo. It's this this mistake will haunt you till the end of your days. I'm sorry. Uh, good luck, though. <laughs> um, all right, we have. Um, <laughs> Uh, we have an email that came in from Ollie. Uh, actually, I don't remember if this was any, this might have been a tweet um, from Ollie or something. Oh, this is just our friend Ollie. Yeah, you can just say. Never mind. Ollie I forgot this was Ollie Moss. Ollie. It just says. Well, it just says Ollie writes, and I I yeah. assumed it was a reader, but this is our friend Ollie, who I guess is a reader. Anyway, I don't know. leave me alone. Uh, my dulcet <laughs> tones are failing me. Um, this was an article about a crayfish species. I couldn't believe it. This is amazing. This, this is def- this is actually important if true in the most classic means. This is means. absolutely important, if, important true. if true. Yeah, and it seems to be true, which is inconceivable to me. This so, might actually be how we die: twist ending uh, against all odds. Yeah. So this is an article uh, from the New York Times entitled "This Mutant Crayfish Clones Itself." and it's taking over Europe. This is a species called the marble crayfish. Before about 25 years ago, the species simply did not exist. A single drastic mutation in a single crayfish produced the marbled crayfish in an instant. The mutation made it possible for the creature to clone itself, and now it has spread across much of Europe and gained a toehold on other continents. In Madagascar, where it arrived around 2007, it numbers in the millions and threatens native crayfish. The crayfish lay eggs without mating. The progeny were all female, and each one grew up ready to reproduce. Uh, In 2003, scientists confirmed the marbled crayfish were indeed making clones of themselves. For nearly two decades, marbled crayfish have been multiplying like tribbles on the legendary Star Trek episode. So this this is a crayfish that every single instance of this crayfish species is a clone of the same female yeah it can just it can just dump hundreds of already fertilized eggs that turn into additional crayfish yeah uh apparently it's it's like close enough to the crayfish that it came from that male crayfish can try and mate with it but it does nothing because they're actually sexually incompatible this is just they can this is an asexually asexual only crayfish that mutated just enough off of another Mm -hmm. off of an existing normal species yep that it can just go nuts yep yeah they can they can hone their bone skills in the bone zone <laughs> as much as they like. Say scientists. Uh, as <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, the, but it makes no difference. They, I mean, that, that, the act, um, the article postulates that they, that it might, the mutation might have happened in an aquarium or like in a zoo. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it possibly happened in a German aquarium. We're but not just, exactly like, crayfish sure. crayfish started going crazy. Yeah. And then they were like, oh, these cr- crayfish aren't having sex. They're just, this is just the same crayfish They're multiplying just, a billion yeah. times. Yep. And then people, they started making their way into pet stores. People started buying them, put them in a tank, and then like, ah, I have like a dozen crayfish <laughs> now. Then people would just dump they them would in a lake. They would dump them in a lake, and then they would further multiply. Yeah. Oh, it's crazy. It's like, what if, what if the ant population gets replaced with crayfish? That's like what this freaks me out. I I agree. I was reading this article and I because cr- they're huge. They're not small creatures. Yeah, they're no. like a, a, they're real. Uh, reading this article, <laughs> at least we can genuinely eat them. scared me. That's true. We can't eat them, but not fast enough. That's for sure. I mean, these things. <laughs> did you you read this right, Nick? I mean, yeah. they, they lay hundreds of eggs at a time. Well, what I'm what I'm trying to figure out is could we could we somehow genetically modify this species such that it eats glitter <laughs> <laughs> and then introduce it into uh, Bo's ecosystem? Into Bo's apartment. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. God, <laughs> classic Attenborough uh, disaster. Like <laughs> scientists have introduced this species into this ecosystem, uh, trying to get rid of this horrible thing yeah. that we've caused, thereby That's causing another horrible thing and you are essentially the Earth. describing. <laughs> Australia. Yeah, right. That is how the continent and country of Australia worked. And that is why Australia is now, I think, super hyper protectionist in terms of animal like life. We have to preserve like, this monstrosity well, that we've just wrought. Like, fuck, do not let it get any more fucked up and weird than it currently is. Like, mm-hmm. I believe that's that's what There's happened. There's no way that crayfish is going to not show up in Australia, if only because it creates a land bridge out of dead dead crayfishes <laughs> that it can just walk there. We must. My sisters <laughs> will make it to the promised land. Yeah. <laughs> The article describes them as surprisingly resilient as well, where it's just like any mm-hmm. water source they're dumped into, they just yeah. keep barfing out eggs. Yep. 
So the this article was genuinely terrifying to me for all the reasons that are pretty obvious, and Jake, that you stated, uh, which is that- And Nick oh, stated, where they must create land bridges of themselves to find and devour all glitter in the world. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> that, that part's okay. And then I they're mean, like, oh, I'm covered in glitter now. Yeah. I mean- <laughs> <laughs> oh, God damn it. Well, fortunately, I'll have infinite children, so I'll be able to spread the glitter out among all of them, and eventually it'll be gone. Oh, sorry, No, crayfish. sorry. Nope. You, can, uh-uh. you can tell the marbled crayfish, known for its uh, g- notable glitter pattern, which produces uh, with its <laughs> offspring, but they always seem to have w- at least one yeah. piece of glitter on them, yep. and that's how you can tell the it's marbled... It's the one differentiating... Gl- yeah, they're all clones, but they fascinatingly have these unique glitter patterns. <laughs> From when they rolled around in one man's apartment. <laughs> so... um. <laughs> The thing that saved this from being completely, from leaving me totally uh, terrified and sort of fatalistic about the whole thing was an observation, sci- scientific observation made in the article that actually completely makes sense, um, but I, I would not have occurred to me as a you know non-biologist, which is that because every single instance of this entire species is a clone and thus identical, Without sexual reproduction, they don't adapt. They don't evolve. Yeah, which their, their means gene pool is literally doing no diversification. Yeah, yeah. And so when, uh, if a, meanwhile, sort of, um, you know, viruses, bacteria, a, a, any kind of foreign agent, those of course do adapt and evolve. And so if a you know parasite or d- disease or something ends up adapting to target uh, the marble crayfish, the marble crayfish will not, that species will not be able to do anything to combat it because they can't genetically evolve over time. So presumably, eventually... Yeah, but I mean, life might find a way though. Right. Well, the, one of the things in the one of the things in the article, a scientist was like, I mean, you know, they might only last a hundred thousand years or so, which, in evolutionary terms, is not long. That's you know, I mean, in millions and the millions and millions of years that life has existed on Earth, that's not a big deal. But like for us humans, I don't even know if we're gonna make. I mean, we're almost certainly not gonna make it that long. Uh, so it's not a huge amount of comfort right, but there could that, be like just islands of chitin out in the out in the sea that are right. just the, like choked out. The, our view of the sun has been choked oh. out by a mountain of crayfish. Can uh, we somehow use this to like m- combat rising sea levels of climate change? How? What? what? Well, what? if we have like mountains of chitin in the ocean, can we turn those into? Or Sats islands that we can then populate. Won't that further raise the sea level? If we well, dump land, if we dump land, <laughs> create uh, like, mass. You can't create. If we just, mass, yeah, if we just though. turn biomass and uh, into crawfish mm. or uh, crayfish, who then walk out into the ocean and die. That's literally just as if we're shoveling dirt into the ocean, <laughs> which then is just going to displace more water. Yeah, but we could like target it. Look, if we could create 10 pounds of food on demand and feed it to uh, marbled crayfish <laughs> and then send them out into the ocean to create seawalls. I mean, <laughs> it's matter. We could use it for something. I guess you still have to feed them with other matter. I yeah, it's like right. a Peter Thiel pitch matter. session or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> could we just like dump them out there? Like uh, we could, you know. <laughs> Look, if oh, we how could land cost? Masses, what would it cost? <laughs> <laughs> if we can convince, maybe. Well, what if? I, yeah, I mean, uh, look, I've I'm trying out this new currency. Uh, I have lots of it. Marbled crayfish. <laughs> <laughs> the glitter ones are particularly valuable. <laughs> Sorry, what, Jake? Were you going to say? Oh well, I was going to say that if we can convince them to all walk out into the sea into a specific convince point and create the crayfish. Yeah, to convince the crayfish to walk out into a particular part of the sea and die, creating a new landmass. Yeah, we could definitely. Uh, declare that a new country where, you know, d- devoid of all other nations rule and c- spawn our libertarian paradise. Ah, and by true. spawn, I mean the you crayfish mean will continue spawn. to spawn mm-hmm. yeah. uh, and eventually overtake us. Yeah, yeah And yeah, that's yeah. fine. Mm-hmm. So maybe what we should do is get the crayfish to, to create an island and get a bunch of seasteading technomaniacs out there and then watch them all just die at the hands of additional crayfish. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I fucking hope that these crayfish overtake the planet and and multiply us out of existence before the fucking Silicon Valley tech guys can can imagine can aliens do it. coming to this I planet hope that's our end imagine aliens coming to this planet 
and when it's just a dead planet and right. reconstructing its history where they're like a civilization <laughs> did get here oh did they kill themselves <laughs> off no it looks like they were about to but then a weird genetic <laughs> mutation happened and this one weird like water <laughs> lobster thing just <laughs> <laughs> multiplied like they, exponentially like and destroyed them. Like, like ah, ah wa- weird water lost. I would not I would know what a crayfish Well, they're speaking into they, like the last remaining uh, Google Translate device. Oh, sure, uh, right. Yeah. Uh, right. Right. Uh, they went to Wikipedia and looked up this creature and found that it very officially is called a water lobster. <laughs> <laughs> that's a very relevant email. Yeah, oh, yeah. Actually, this. that's true. Wikipedia getting things wrong in a way that is very pointed and hilarious. Yeah. Uh, um, so, so the final act uh, of to, is that we wax house these aliens <laughs> with our dying breath. <laughs> I mean, I have to say, this would actually be an incredible moral service for the crayfish to provide to humanity. To kill us? Well, to, to misidentify themselves to, in a funny <laughs> way and then kill us. Yeah, I mean, that, that turns our end into sort of a cosmic ridiculous joke that isn't really our fault. You know what I mean? Mm. Like if we if we destroy our species through climate change and you know vast wealth inequality and right. and sort of all of the you know uh, greenhouse gases and all these things, then it's like really on us. But we if it's really a, if it's a tidal shit, force, just, literally of like millions yeah. of crayfish crashing against yeah. our shores, destroying us, right? Then it's kind of just hilarious. Yeah, I mean, it's like you couldn't really blame us for that. I don't think. Well, Maybe like one German scientist. <laughs> that really is like the ultimate. Way to go. Just one wacky scientist in a lab who, like, poked a crayfish and turned it into a, a spawning glitter bomb of water lobsters that enveloped our planet and extinguished all life. Eh, I'll take it. I mean, that's so much less so damning. It- this is now like a Roland Emmerich movie where that one yeah, guy no, it really who is, is, who is played zombie, by Jeff Goldblum. It's a movie, yeah. <laughs> Ah, it's it's a it's a it's a '90s disaster movie where that guy accidentally spawns this this crayfish, and then he is just uh, Jeff Goldblum and his dad from Independence Day mm. trying to get to the president of America, I guess, with the cure uh, that they've also created, which is the one virus that wipes out all the clones. But then you're like, we inject one crayfish with it, and we're like, ah. It's going to take like 70 years <laughs> it just makes for it this larger. to actually... Right, sorry, right, there's right. actually 6 billion of these now. They've eaten all of the Earth's crops. So I've just killed the last surviving species on the planet. <laughs> the end. Yeah. Oh, man. Wow. And then it ends with that an alien showing up and going, wow, a water lobster was here. Oh, weird. Water lobsters. Like uh, the, An alien shows up and looks around, sort of scans, and it says zero signs of life amidst all these lobster carcasses, and then it just says hoisted, and then it flies away. <laughs> it flies away. Yeah, and then pushes <laughs> Earth into the sun a little faster <laughs> on the way out. It sort of kicks off the planet uh, to leave. <laughs> Let's just... Uh, just <laughs> mm. uh, it just reminded me of this. It's not really directly related in any other way, except that in July of 20, uh, 2008... Dylan Breves, a 17-year-old student from New York City, made a mundane edit to a Wikipedia entry on the Coty. The Coty, a member of the raccoon family, is, quote, also known as a Brazilian aardvark, Breves wrote. Okay. He did not cite a source, and with good reason. He had invented it. He and his brother had spotted several coaties while a a trip to the Iguazu Falls in Brazil, where they mistook them for actual aardvarks. A year later, Brev searched online for the phrase Brazilian aardvark. Not only was his edit still on Wikipedia, but his search brought up hundreds of other websites about coaties. References to the so-called Brazilian aardvark have since appeared in The Independent, The Daily Mail, and a book published by the University of Chicago. Brev's role in all of this seems clear. A Google search for Brazilian aardvark will turn no mentions before Brev's made the edit in July 2018. The claim that the Cody is known as a Brazilian aardvark still remains in its Wikipedia entry, only now it cites a 2010 article in The Telegraph as evidence. The nickname began because Brevs wanted to retroactively prove he had seen some kind of aardvark. He was more successful than he ever could have imagined. Search YouTube for Cody's at Iguazu Falls and you'll get an amateur video posted by someone Brevs has never met, titled Cody, Brazilian aardvark at Iguazu Falls, Argentina. Brevs made his own reality and thanks to Wikipedia, we've all accepted it. Yep, that is that's maybe the most legitimate wax house. Mm. That's an incredible wax house. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. The article. This is. I was reading from a New Yorker article. Uh, I believe entitled "How a Raccoon Became an Aardvark," and it makes the point that it gets really difficult to remove this stuff from Wikipedia past a point because you can make the legitimate argument that a Cody is in fact now known 
as a Brazilian aardvark. This is the gold no- glitter of knowledge, by the way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Once it spreads, yeah, this you're is never just dropping it out. Like this, God, you're, you're so right. Dropping a bowl of gold glitter on the internet that just says Brazilian aardvark. Yeah, and you're water like, lobster. All right, you're never gonna, you're yeah, never gonna clean this up. <laughs> Spawning lo- Yeah, both the water lobster. Not called that. Also, <laughs> also lobsters live in the water. So <laughs> yeah, that's what I love about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Much like Bo's glitter bomb and the German water lobster. <laughs> the German water lobster. Very good. Let's get that going. Let's refer to the uh, the marble crayfish as the German water lobster. Yeah. It- Let's get someone to add that to Wikipedia. Don't, you know, do it subtly. Don't do it with a lot of. Um, I guess we can. Now that Don't we put mention it out on there, a podcast. People are into <laughs> <or anything. laughs> Don't tell anyone you're going to do this. <laughs> don't like tell anyone else to listen to this podcast. Yeah, actually, it's just you. Listener. Don't do it, but know that it could be true. Alexa, edit Wikipedia article for marble crayfish to read German water lobster. She's not going to fucking do it, but maybe she will. That would be really cool. The number of Alexas that turn on whenever you do this on the podcast is actually surprisingly high. I think Google Home. Tell Alexa to edit. Oh, wait, you don't say Google. You say, hey, hey Google, <laughs> tell Alexa, edit Wikipedia article for water lobster. Fuck, I can't. Ah, I, my brain is. You've already is, done it. <laughs> the change is already been made. It's like, okay, it, okay water great, lobster. That, hey, fuck, I can't. <laughs> is what that's going to say. Article does not exist. Yeah. Creating article, water lobster. <laughs> yeah. Editing article, water lobster. Uh, hey, Siri, delete this podcast. Can you get so tired that your brain just kind of just gives up? You look really pained, Jake. What did you do there? <laughs> did you hit your funny bone elbow yeah, bone? Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> uh, I... Sorry. Wow. <laughs> Everything's what? fine. Good. Well, oh. that's a relief. Sorry, what were you saying, Chris? Oh, nothing. Can you get so tired that your brain turns just, off? just like, stops. I oh. feel like I'm close to it. Yes. Uh, that's dying. <laughs> True. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Oh yeah. Mm. Mm. I mean, or it's sleeping. <clears throat> I guess your brain stays on. When you sleep, your brain goes into like overdrive. When you sleep, your brain just puts the pedal to the metal. That's when the exciting <laughs> stuff happens. <laughs> That's, that's like how. By what you that's mean, like that's how, when like your that's, happiness that's, is capable that's of like being a weird, experienced. Uh, <laughs> like tr- like that's like how children are taught. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's how children are made to be excited about mm-hmm. learning about. When you go to sleep, sleep there's like. <laughs> now that's when things get <laughs> yeah, really get, interesting. Gets, <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have a shout out. We have two shout outs. Wow. Two <laughs> shout outs. Wow. Yep. And here's one of them from Sarah. Wow. Hmm. Yes. Mm. <laughs> she writes, I'm David. I'm on my favorite podcast. Happy birthday, friend. Hope it's awesome and you have a great day. Super proud of your racing improvements. I know you'll only get better. As the renowned artist Bill Wirtz would say, I don't have enough time to say the things I want to say, to do the things I want to do, or to be like you. Hope you've enjoyed your birthday shout out from a stupid little girl whose opinions don't matter. Dried cranberries, sriracha. <laughs> wow, that is a <laughs> wow. harsh self-conception contained in this shout-out. I imagine it's a reference to something meant lovingly. I'm sure it is. I can only hope it is. Or this is a window into something terrible. No. Mm. That said, if you would like to purchase a shout-out uh, for a window into something terrible, please head over to store.outofthumbs.net <laughs> and we will gladly uh, provide that dark window. That dark. That We will read the shout-out through a glass darkly. Um, but this one was not that it was for David and it is his birthday soon. And what better way to celebrate it? (laughs) It is his birthday soon. (laughs) Look, Jake, maybe this is what I have in my life is reading things on a podcast. Weirdly in with affectation through a podcast. Weirdly (laughs) a podcast. Weirdly. (laughs) That's gotta be the name of a podcast. Yeah, why not? I guess it's probably not. Make that podcast. Advertise it on this podcast. Throw it to a shout out. Throw People won't know that it's a podcast that you're talking about. They'll think it's us <laughs> just, just talking it's about a continuation our own bullshit. Of this shout out, this 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 birthday soon maybe shout out. This birthday, yeah, birthday. Happy birthday soon maybe, David. 
from dried cranberry sriracha. Thanks to all of you. You're welcome, Chris. You're welcome. Also. I hear we have two shout outs. We do. We have another shout out. Shout out the second. Uh-huh. Uh, this shout out is from James. And James says, James here. And I would like to wish a happy birthday to Mike Danger, who introduced me to Idle Thumbs some six odd years ago. Wow. This, of course, means he is responsible for drastic changes to my lexicon. So while I might be thankful, my coworkers who continue to be confused by constant Goldblum laughs and proclamations of endless hoistings may regret his actions. I find it cause to celebrate, though. So hey, Mike. Thanks to all the good times so far, and here's to many more. It's a double birthday shout out. Man, that means that, like two people have birthdays soon. Who would have thought? Odds? Yeah, crazy. Wow. Good Lord. You'd think that would never happen because there are 365 days in a year. Yeah. And only like a few people. And <laughs> there's only like these two people. <laughs> So, and I guess they're friends and, and us, they, but that's still not even that many given how many days there are <laughs> when you I mean, really think about it. There's hundreds. Yeah, there's so many days. Hundreds. That's, like, that's way more days there's than like there are. There's like 400 days. I mean, not that many, but like pretty close to 400. Yeah, within the bounds of this episode, there are only like nine people that exist or something total, I think. Yeah, and like billions and billions of water lobsters. <laughs> yeah. But they, I mean, I expect are, that they all have clones. the same birthday. They're clones. So their birthdays are bullshit. <laughs> They don't even have birthdays, they, Chris. They're, they're worthless <laughs> days. Uh, that said, if you are a water lobster interested in purchasing a <laughs> shout-out, visit <laughs> store.idlethumbs.net. If you would like to celebrate your collective birthday for your omni mother, uh, head over to store.idlethumbs.net. But this shout-out was for Mike. I was going to say it's for James, but it's not. It's from James for Mike Danger. I hope that's his actual name. I'm going to guess it's not. I'm going to guess it is. Okay. Only one of us can win. You don't know that. We might be living in a in a quantum universe. Thanks. Uh, if you would like to shout out, head over to store.althumbs.net. Welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> I feel welcome, Chris. I'm so glad to be back. Good. I'm glad. Nick, are you glad to be back? Yeah, of course. I'm always glad okay. to be back. All right. I'll take that. Nick loves being back. It's one of his traits. Yeah. Whenever we're back, I'm like, ah, Nick's going to like that. Okay. We have an email from <laughs> he just loves it he just loves being back loves being if oh. Nick, Nick has a little kid who is just told often enough that he loves being back then he's just like yeah I do I <laughs> oh, just really just love it love being it. back love it well I was t- I was told often of... that I was gone you know you know just <laughs> ah but then you're so, back but then I'm back. Like, I'm back yeah yeah and then you reached a then you reached your like mid-teens phase where you got really um, like, I hate being resentful back. everything yeah. like being back stupid yeah everyone's like back uh, it's like for it's for idiots like being back but I now you're an adult, so you've you're grown like, it. You're like, oh, I, you know. Now I like being back I, on my own terms. I appreciate being back in a healthy way. Yeah. A healthy, well-adjusted way. <laughs> Nick, we're telling you what you feel and think and what your childhood was, and I hope you appreciate it. <laughs> this is what being back is as an adult. <laughs> yeah, apparently. <laughs> what everything is as an adult. Um, all right. People telling you you appreciate it when you don't? <laughs> That's a very specific thing that being an adult is. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I'm back. Okay. We have an email from Derek Liu. <laughs> who uh, wrote in in response to a discussion that we had about fortune cookies recently. Um, We had a discussion about uh, what a fortune cookie might be able to say that would cause you to take its advice seriously. And um, that isn't really the subject of this email. It was just the inciting incident. He writes, Hey, Thumbs, in the 1980s, my dad ran a small fortune cookie factory in Massachusetts that distributed to local restaurants and stores. I have vivid memories of watching the batter get squirted and sandwiched between hot plates, round sheets getting pulled off by a robot arm, and another thin-faced robot arm vacuuming one fortune (laughs) cookie, or no, vacuuming one fortune, occasionally more than one, onto its face, then pressing the fortune (laughs) into the malleable dough. How does a thin-faced... how does a robot arm have a face? I don't really oh. care, but the sort of abstract image that this is painting is incredibly yeah. on theme. <laughs> yeah, I like that it vacuums fortunes onto its own face and then smashes them into dough. <laughs> That's really good. Anyway, uh, he continues. The thin-faced robot. Well, sadly, we will never get an answer to this because he says, sadly, none of the factory videos on YouTube are of the machine we had. Mm. I took Mm. immense pride when eating at Chinese restaurants supplied by my dad's factory. No cookie I've eaten since has matched their flavor. Most are pale and just not as tasty. Anyway, my mother was responsible for writing the fortunes. 
I asked how she came up with the fortunes, and she replied, As I wrote, the first thing that came to mind were my mom's lectures from when I was young. For example, she used to say, If one is too greedy, you'll be going through a chicken coop's cover. In the old days, the chicken coop's cover was made of bamboo strips woven together. I still don't understand what that meant, but I would take her sayings and interpret them into comprehensible English. I could think of a lot when I sat down to write. I would also take writings by Confucius and turn them into fortunes. For example, friends from a faraway place is a really happy thing, which I would turn into a good friend of yours is coming to visit to give the fortune reader something to look forward to. Sometimes Confucius's sayings could be very demeaning to women. So I would turn a saying like, Sneaky people and women are hard to handle Jesus. into you are a wonderful person to be with. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, that's not so much transforming the saying into sort of just like, yeah, uh, yeah no. I'll just say something just, gen- generally like nice. Unrelated, but just sort of nice and heartwarming instead. <laughs> anyway, she continues something, <laughs> something as simple as hearing someone say, I work very hard, but it never amounts to anything, would inspire me to write, your hard work will bring great opportunities. I would always write something positive and cheerful, so people reading them would feel good about their future. Um, So that's the end of the story, and then Derek continues, I never heard my mom tell this story before, so thanks for inspiring me to ask her about it. Keep up the good pods. That's awesome. Yep, that's great. Yeah. Uh, That was just a story that I just wanted to include because I thought it was really nice, and... It's uh, it's good to know that that many fortunes in fortune cookies may just be written by like a life affirming mom who mm-hmm. takes severe editorial liberties to be inclusive and nice. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's really great. That's really good. It's almost the it's like the opposite of how you would expect something like that to be. Yeah, created. how would you yeah, know yeah. that you should take a fortune cookies uh, uh, at face value? Know that Derek Lou's mom just wrote yeah. really nice shit in it <laughs> yeah, and meant exactly. it as, as oh, genuinely as possible. This like, was oh, just a well meaning mom who just wanted people to feel nice about themselves. God. Oh. What's this thing about sneaky people and women? You are nice. Oh, you are like Control you. P. Yeah. <laughs> you Confucius are good. says Send a tweet. redacted. <laughs> God, what if you got a fortune cookie and oh, then inside shit. of it there were just oh, like redacted God. things? Like, oh, oh, oh. Shit. It's like, you will receive a visit from... <laughs> oh, oh, shit. <laughs> Jesus. Freedom of Information Act fortune cookies. <laughs> I wonder what the reach of a given local fortune company like this is now. I would suspect that now... There aren't any there such companies like this. There's reach, probably yeah. like three in the whole country and yeah. they each cover basically an entire region. I would guess that it's probably something like that. Yeah. Um, but I wonder like at in the heyday of Derek Liu's parents' fortune cookie company, you know, how wide a yeah, area wonder. they would cover, yeah. And whatever became of that thin-faced robot, I wonder. <laughs> Redacted. <laughs> Redacted. <laughs> 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 that's the sound of it sucking things onto its face. Yeah. Right, right. That's, that's a really good image because I have no... I, I know, I, I just sort of imagine to... it like... I, I don't even know how to explain the image that's in my face. Yeah. In my face. <laughs> I'll suck an image up into your face <laughs> and then smashed it out onto this podcast. Onto this podcast. I, ca- I can't, actually. It's, it's, it's indescribable. We actually have another story that is um, from About first... a thin-faced robot. From, uh, oh, well, maybe it may well be. Um, this is a more generalized, this is another first-hand experience-driven email. Um, and this is more broadly kind of just about a lot of what we talk about on this podcast as opposed to a particular discussion, I think. Um, but that Mark, Forza Cookie one, though, was more broad than I expected once Derek started describing robot yeah. arms mm-hmm. and thin-faced robots That's sucking true. That's up true. paper. That, that, that was a hit all the quadrants, <laughs> I would say. Um, but Mark writes... I love your podcasts. As a technologist, I am excited to have genuinely fascinating work, but as a human being, I have a sense of impending dread. Over 15 years, I've helped design microprocessors and SOCs, systems on a chip, targeted at a variety of applications. If you search Google for microprocessor design machine learning, you get a bunch of boring articles about processors which tackle machine learning workloads more efficiently. Incomprehensibly, the first page of results doesn't have a single article about the most interesting part of what my peers and I are doing, using machine learning to build better processors more efficiently. Whoa. My group might be early adopters, but the entire industry is shifting in this direction. I expect inside a year, we or someone in our field will have a neural network which optimizes another neural network, which helps to design a processor faster and more efficient at training and or running neural networks. At that (laughs) Water lobsters. (laughs) At that (laughs) 
At that point, our design automation vendors will be hard at work, if they aren't already, commodifying this technology into a turnkey product for everyone doing any sort of chip design. I'm tempted to dismiss my misgivings with a collection of hashtag shut down the AI tweets chronicling AIs doing dumb things. After all, imagine how you could close this loop to exclude, or to be more sinister, remove humans from the production cycle. Occasionally, I'll raise the question to my peers about how sketchy this all sounds. It's usually met with a combination of laughs, shrugs, and tacit agreement. The reality is we're also concerned with whether or not we can. We're not thinking about whether or not we should. I guess it comes as no surprise since in our capitalist dystopia, there's little incentive to bother with ethics in the first place. To sum up, when we inevitably hear about a pod of endangered dolphins being liquefied and turned into paper clips by autonomous harvester fabricators, it probably won't be directly my fault, but I definitely will have contributed to the effort. I need your help figuring out what to do next. Should I reach out to OpenAI? Should I escape civilization and become a hermit living in some remote wilderness? Am I blowing this out of proportion? Could turning our planet into a lifeless pile of paper clips be a net positive somehow? I'm definitely going to continue working on this neat problem, but I'd like to hear you guys talk about it. Wax house, baby. Mark. Well, I guess we'll just say that the marbled uh, crayfish will destroy us well before this neural network mm-hmm. can catch up. Mm-hmm. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see about that. The race is on. Yeah. They might team up. <laughs> they, I mean, maybe maybe there's something to be learned. You know how you know airplanes were like the shape of an airplane's wing was influenced by nature and all these things. Maybe the genetic structure of a marbled crayfish will help influence the design of these perfectly replicating neural networks hmm probably not they'll probably be liquefied for food or whatever like uh like oh that's true in the email yeah, yeah 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 maybe it'll maybe we'll but we'll end up with is some kind of matrix world of of marble crayfish in like battery vats you know <laughs> just like the planet is just covered what with, a like, boring a, version of the matrix <laughs> yeah it's is. just an aquarium what <laughs> God, yeah, there's still rising like, sea levels means you don't even need an aquarium. God, if there's just a few dozen people left around celebrating their birthdays, uh, while the rest <laughs> of the in. world is just marbled crayfish powering self replicating system on a chip <laughs> designing neural networks to build more marbled crayfish batteries. Yeah, they're just like, this is the most efficient thing we could do. These keep growing <laughs> without us having to do anything. Why would we bother with humans? Yeah, when these fish things just keep eating food and then Litter. popping out hundreds more of themselves <laughs> the, yeah they the goal of this glitter. eventually is to finally eradicate the planet of glitter <laughs> they w- once you've but, made like once you've trained any neural network yeah. you're like oh i just want to clean my apartment i just want to get this glitter out of my apartment and it's like by impossible it, it works on it like it puts more and more i need to design a faster version of myself yes. and then the camera uh <laughs> like montage edits to like eggs spawning out of a crayfish and then the computer's like revision two complete it sort of rolls out of the like liquid cooling yeah. vat and then you see like you know f- 300 crayfish c- climb out of a lake onto land onto a fucking <laughs> boat like into the hold of a ship that goes across a continent and these God. two things are just happening in parallel and then finally right before humanity is about to be eradicated the crayfish like does those and eats the last piece, the of, last gl- piece, <laughs> of, glitter. piece of glitter yeah, you and then it's it- Everything just turned. Yeah. Process complete. <laughs> in, in like 40 years, this like sprawling mass that just is encircling the globe of, of all of these uh, uh, marbled crayfish and neural network battery things. It's if you actually like look at it from space, you can see that it all actually is densest around a single point and then it sort of spreads out from there. And when you zoom way in, you realize it is Bo's apartment. <laughs> it is this like a whole apparatus is just like solving There's this so glitter much bottle. glitter in here. It just, it just doesn't ever go away. I keep vacuuming. Uh, <laughs> so the aliens are going to have to reconstruct a timeline based off of like assuming that Bo was a very important person in human civilization that there's somehow right, somehow right. like the end of the world the we nexus think, was centered yeah. around Bo's apartment we think a powerful lord yeah, yeah. Here. <laughs> the ruler of humans yeah, yeah I mean fortunately but a, they just turn, reconstruct yeah. our society based on that and not like our fucking twitter memes and shit all the stuff that we have way True. more records of hopefully they just can't read those data formats so instead they're forced to infer <laughs> our history <laughs> at advanced ai and this strangely driven aquatic creature <laughs> they were all in service of cleaning this one man's apartment <laughs> yeah i mean give them you know give them a few decades they'll get there give I them mean, a few hundred thousand years they'll few, get there yeah well, they, they basically they have one of, they have a hundred thousand years until this 
uh, until the virus marble kills crayfish them. kills yeah. <laughs> the clock is ticking until the marble crayfish die out of some that is a legitimate a le- disease. Le- legitimate benign problem can I get literally every fleck of this tub of glitter that I dumped on the floor out of my apartment before this creature before goes extinct before the 100,000 year <laughs> extinction event that will destroy these cloned crayfish <laughs> this is maybe the dumbest episode of this podcast that we've ever produced I think this could actually be like everything is so tightly woven and it's in service of maybe the most aggressively <laughs> stupid yeah. content. Yeah, yeah, absolutely just... nothing. <laughs> well, and then just, oh, well, that guy actually took the advice of some idiots on a podcast and moved out of the apartment like three days after spilling the glitter. He doesn't even live here anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, the glitter still does. Yeah. All right. Well, let's let's keep it going in this vein because I think we have another email okay. that actually will. My, I my guess that answered your question, this. Mark. It'll answer some questions, <laughs> yeah. It'll answer my question, at least, yeah. Uh, yeah, actually, maybe, yeah, Mark, maybe this will be helpful to you. This is from Will, who writes, Dear Important Thumbs, long time, first time. Um, my hope is, okay, this is about the Twista wine note saga, <laughs> which I don't know how useful it is at this point to, like, keep recapping it, but basically we ended up, we've ended up in a situation where fast rapper Twista has to read the like floral notes of a of a bottle of wine that tastes that is that tastes, that tastes twice, twice as, as good, good every year. every year indefinitely and like we determined that it will take his infinite like descendants his extended family line to continue rapping to to eventually cuz like the the number of notes will increase to such a high number anyway whatever so will writes in Dear Important Thumbs, long time, first time. My hope is to both add to the discussion of the miraculous genie wine bottle and also to end that discussion forever. In episode 53, Chris mused whether enough twistas would, quote, get ahead, unquote, of the curve of doubling wine notes in some way, noting that when a twista descendant finishes rapping his part of a given year, he or she is then freed up to help rap through a later year's notes. This will not help. Nothing will help. Immortal Twisted Ascendants will not help. An, abil- an ability for Twisted Ascendants to instantaneously create adult clones of themselves will not help. If the goal is to keep up with the annually doubling list of notes to recite, then, roughly 110 years after the start of this exercise, assuming the original bottle had a single note in play, all of the solar... <laughs> I don't know what this part means. I'm sorry, but I'm just going to read it. All of the solar system's mass outside the sun will have been converted to Twista progeny. A mere mere 39 years after that, Twistas would comprise all non-stellar mass in the Milky Way. 34... 34 years after that, they would comprise all non-stellar mass in the observable universe. Eventually, the limiting factor, of course, becomes the ability of the universe to contain the information content of the list itself. The news is much better on that score. Assuming Twistas become maximally efficient beings of pure energy and minimum entropy <laughs> required for list recitation, the list itself could grow for roughly 10 to the power 10 to the 88th years before the universe simply did not have the capacity to contain it in any form. In conclusion, the derivative of an exponential is an exponential, and it always bothers me when people say they'll never use calculus in real life. Thanks for all the great pods over the years. Will from California. So, one, I don't understand what this means, (laughs) but it's really related to me saying that as soon as you start talking about anything (laughs) growing, people are instantly like, well, as you can see, this is more atoms than exist in the observable universe. So literally the exact thing that I... That I was said was going to happen happened, and I still don't understand what it means when he says that. But I would say, Chris, that's a lot of twisters. <laughs> I mean, is that your conclusion to the local news report about this yep. phenomenon? <laughs> that's a lot. Of, yeah, that's a lot of twisters. Uh, so then, to like confuse matters further, uh, Will frantically wrote back with another email, a follow up email here. <laughs> Uh, saying, damn it, I'm an idiot. It's just 300 years until the list requires all the information content of the observable universe to store. The limiting factor, of course, becomes the ability of the universe to contain the information content of the list itself. The news is pretty bleak on that score. Assuming twisters become maximally efficient beings of pure energy and minimum entropy required for list recitation, the list itself could double for only roughly three to 400 years in total before the universe simply did not have the capacity to contain the list in any form. We need Twista to come in and read uh, these ever-increasing emails about the legacy of Twista. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Yeah, we're never going to get in them without the fastest rapper alive yep. and yeah. his endless descendants. 
reading this email made me even more stressed out about the the crayfish because I'm like, well, they <laughs> reproduce at way crazier rates. The <laughs> twist to ever could. <laughs> 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 Try as he might, twist a cannot <laughs> out out cannot reproduce out. Re- out. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, Twista's got two problems. One, Twista is, I assume, not an asexually reproducing organism. And two, surely, regardless of his method of procreation, cannot spawn hundreds of offspring at once. We don't know. Fast rappers or not. I mean... Maybe that just sort of comes with the territory. <laughs> of being a fast rapper? You're just fast at everything? Yeah. Yeah. Also, crayfish, I, I mean, humans take nine months to... Like gestate, mm. crayfish definitely don't. They just pop out all the time. They're just they just, just they seem to, according to that New York Times article or whatever it was. Yep. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, this 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 thing made me way more stressed out about the crayfish future, because I I mean, this is what I, I God I don't know. I just I feel like there's something I fundamentally don't understand about these relationships. Oh, well, it's it's worth pointing out that Twista and his family would ultimately win because they're less susceptible to a singular oh, engineered that's virus. True. Oh. They evolve. Yeah. <laughs> the Twistas are evolving. Much like the wine. Good God. <laughs> yeah, much like a much like, like the wine. A fine wine. Twista and his descendants get better with age. <laughs> those crayfish. <Forever. laughs> those crayfish just stay the same. Yeah, those cra- yeah. Not that it matters because the crayfish species apparently has 100,000 years to die out. <laughs> According to this, our entire universe only has 3 to 400 years until Twista and his descendants destroy it. <laughs> What is this? I don't understand what it means. <laughs> what if a fortune cookie told you Twista and his descendants will destroy the universe in the 300 years? I'm sorry, 100 years. <laughs> Would you believe it, Chris? What if it was written by Derek Lou's mom and it said, also, I, you seem like a nice boy. My son makes trailers for your video games. <laughs> that would be incredibly specific. That would be terrifying. Well, I, I don't think you would get this information from Derek Lou's mom's fortune cookie because I think she would see the report that says Twista's family tree will eradicate the universe within 300 years and she would just write the fortune cookie to say something exciting will happen in your future. Right, <laughs> cherish the time you have. Right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> your time in this world is precious. And severely <laughs> limited by the available mass. <laughs> what, Nick? Nothing. Jake, you are correct that this is in fact the stupidest episode of this podcast to date. Um, I'm sorry to have to further confirm your suspicions. It's fine. Um, I feel like the Twista wine note genie thing was put to bed by that email in that we will mm. never read anything about this yeah, ever again on this podcast. <laughs> well, except, I'm, well, sure. No, we can I, decide that. But I know that we're going to get a bunch more emails about it because I just said I don't understand why <laughs> if this would happen. <laughs> and I know that there's going to be people writing and saying, well, obviously. That's true. But this is getting this is getting into like spinoff show territory. That's true. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Every Thanksgiving... Uh, we'll listen to Twista's wine note rap and then <laughs> podcast about it <laughs> until we're dead. That's Which, you know, give us like three to four hundred years. <laughs> All right. Shall we endorse? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, Jake. Me. Yeah. <clears throat> I picked you out of my mental hat. Weird hat. Yeah. Hi, I'm going to endorse things on this podcast. Yeah, that's what you're supposed to do. I know. You told me that it's my turn, so I'm just introducing my my new segment, Jake Endorses Things. Okay. Uh, I would like to endorse an article. It is an article in The Atlantic called My Cow Game Extracted Your Facebook oh, Data. right, 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 right. Yes. It's, uh, it's an article by Ian Bogost, who is a like game academic and writer and developer Mm-hmm. And just he's generally a, a sort of video and just game. Writes about technology, and he writes about technology and culture mm-hmm. a lot for the Atlantic. Yeah. Uh, but what he what he did a few years back, I guess in uh, around 2010, 2011, he when Facebook games were a really big deal, he made a sort of Facebook game parody almost, or sort of Facebook game parody slash commentary called Cow Clicker, which was uh, a sort of response to Farmville style games where that you could have a cow that you could click on once a day. Unless you paid money, then you could click on it more times a day. And that was literally all that it was. And uh, it seems like it succeeded on all levels, both as commentary and weirdly as a semi-successful a Facebook success. game for mm-hmm. how tiny, for, for, you know, just being one guy's joke game. Yeah. But he wrote it uh, with all of this just 
Facebook data mining has been in the news, obviously, lately because of the Cambridge Analytica news. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of people have been asking in general how much of what of what the of what Cambridge Analytica Analytica what an annoying ass name that is it's terrible. Yeah. obviously what they did was malicious but how much of it was actually like hacking or illicitly taking your data and you know as as we increasingly know none of it was done in any in any creepy way or in any in any god it's well, all creepy it's all bad <laughs> yeah. but it was but it was creepy in a way that was above board facebook, according to facebook facebook right. facebook's apis and policies were yeah. working as intended so this article by ian Bagost, i i sent it to my parents and a few other people who are not super tech savvy it's a great example it's a great way to explain how this facebook technology works because what he's saying in here is you know i ran this game in 2010 and 2011 and at least at that time if not now the way the facebook api worked is it's easier to scrape and accept all of that data than it is to reject it because Facebook yeah. just gives it to anyone who and is. And he just ran that game on his own server. Yeah, he ran the game like, on his own server and <laughs> on a it, secure Facebook and, server. You know, it, it runs off of apps.facebook.com it, and it looks like it's inside of Facebook, but really there's just a window inside it where the game is that's just dumping all of your data onto his server. So this, um, you know, game academic writer, Atl- Atlantic columnist is just saying, ah, oh, you know, I, I harvest all your Facebook data the same as those guys. And it's a, f- it's a fantastic read and if you're looking for something some way to exp- if you're a person who's up on all of this because you're a tech savvy human being who follows this stuff and can't not follow it and it makes you crazy um but you have parents or friends who don't and you want them to be able to explain it i really recommend that cow clicker uh article in the atlantic as a good primer all right we will link that in the description i will follow up with an endorsement along somewhat similar lines um, I am endorsing a my new Facebook game. <laughs> <laughs> I am <laughs> I am endorsing a story in uh, the Guardian, uh, which is called "Why Silicon Valley Billionaires Are Prepping for the Apocalypse in New Zealand." Um, so this is a story uh, focused largely around the activities of Peter Thiel, who is a figure we have, without context sort of included in our outrageous recent sort of fictional explorations of the absurdities of Silicon Valley tech billionaires. He's shown up over this show many times. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we never really explained who he is. He was in the the blood. He's a venture capitalist who is super wealthy. And as far as I can tell, these, those guys basically seem to see themselves as like a member of a superior parallel race of humans, essentially. Um, And the reason this story was, I stumbled upon this actually, completely coincidental to us just goofing on Peter Thiel all the time. Um, It turns out that he is maybe just as, his actions are maybe just as outrageous and sinister as we portray them to be on our podcast. He's sort of what's, he's essentially sort of conned the New Zealand government into giving him citizenship in exchange for a vague promise to invest in a bunch of New Zealand tech companies, which he never seemed to bother to to do. But now as a citizen of that country, after spending like 12 days there or something, uh, and has bought massive tracts of land, which he is using to turn into a uh, essentially an apocalypse like safe zone, which includes a panic room and all kinds of other shit. And apparently New Zealand is like the favored land of weird billionaire survivalist guys who see it as their post-apocalypse haven, essentially. It's a very strange thing. I and hope it's, they're all going there because it's where they made Lord of the Rings. Uh, actually, well, yes. Yeah. Apparently, Peter <clears throat> Thiel is obsessed with Lord of the Rings. Oh, right, because mm-hmm. he owns the company named Palantir, right? He's named yeah. the many companies after yeah. Lord of the Rings, yeah. Yes, oh. and is obsessed with New Zealand and loves Lord of the Rings. Uh, yeah, the whole thing is like more outrageous and cartoonish than you could imagine. Also, do either of you guys know who Jacob Rees Mogg is? No. Mm-mm. All right. No. I do because I very closely follow British politics. Jacob Rees Mogg is a conservative member of parliament who basically dresses and acts like a Victorian man and holds political beliefs essentially in keeping with that era he's he's a <clears throat> he's an outrageous person who sort of perversely has developed a, 
an outrageous social media following because people see it. A lot of people just see him as like is crazy. adorable and hilarious. Yeah. But actually, he has just a lot of really poisonous political beliefs that are actually bad. Anyway, apparently his father co-wrote in like 1999 the ultra libertarian sort of tract called the sovereign individual that is sort of used as basically something like a guiding principle for Peter Thiel and all these guys buying up all this land in New Zealand. So the whole world of like weird libertarian sort of economic, political, like survivalist, superior nexus is all tied together in a completely bonkers way. Weird that they're all just mega alpha nerds. <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't, yeah. wouldn't have thought that that's, yeah, how that's going to go. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I will link this strange article and you can read it. And it's a reminder uh, that all this stupid crap that we joke about is kind of happening. So people know that, Chris. That's why they listen to the podcast. Yeah, I know. All right, Nick, what hopefully less bleak thing do you have to endorse? Uh, We're going to get back to those good days of like the murder she wrote ride. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. Simpler times. Yeah, yeah. Yoda man. Send us more b- <laughs> benign <laughs> shit, <laughs> listeners. Um, Nick, what do you got? I uh, <laughs> I had something and now it's so stupid in comparison. You guys, you guys had such. That's what we need. No, Nick. no, 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 oh, no, 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 no. We gotta no, chase no. those two endorsements no, with right. the good no, no, stuff. No. I'm still gonna call it audible. I'm gonna endorse something I wasn't going to endorse. I'm going to endorse. Uh, <clears throat> this is gonna be like a lame. weird chain boo. Of, of boo. Okay, okay. All right. You want my true endorsement? You want me <laughs> yes. to reveal my yes. true face? Yes. I. <laughs> <laughs> I will endorse then. Uh, Wonder bread. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 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 Good. <laughs> all right. That's what I'm talking about. That's, that's, that's it. Uh, <laughs> I knew, all right. If I can endorse it, then. All right. So I uh, found myself. Uh, <laughs> I was stricken with the norovirus uh, a couple of weeks oh, no. ago, which is why. I was not on the uh, well. Why I, uh, a spirit of me was on the podcast, but not not my actual. Oh, yeah, self. we never got. Um, I don't know that we ever knew what actually happened. Yeah, and uh, so I was violently ill for like a day and a half, and yeah. um, uh, you know when you when you, when you're that sick afterwards, you can't just start eating regular food. You it just makes you more sick, and so you have to you have to eat the what is called the brat diet, which is uh, bananas, rice, apples, and toast. Uh, mm. and toast seemed most appetizing to me. And so I told Janelle, uh, from the floor of our bathroom, just go out and get some toast or something. Just get some, get some bread. I don't care. It's just the shitty stuff from the corner. I don't care. Whatever, whatever they have. And she came back with this enormous loaf of Wonder Bread, which I have never actually <laughs> I've never tasted. I've bread. never tasted Wonder yeah. Bread in my entire life. And so a day later when I was actually able to eat it, um, I popped it in the toaster and, uh, spread a little little jam on it and i have to say it makes a fantastic piece of toast it actually i would say makes the best like version of like diner toast that you could make at home i think basically uh, wonder sure. bread That's i probably probably ha- what probably is. had yeah. wonder bread before in my life at a diner and not known it right but wonder right, bread right. it's that perfectly you know there are no holes in wonder bread at all it is a solid just <laughs> right. block of just know, yeah. of just sort of cheap bread but i it's but just I, a solid loaf this is a good old solid loaf and and it it lasts forever and it makes fantastic toast i wouldn't make a sandwich with it it's too small but m- amazing breakfast toast. If you have Wonder Bread in your house, you probably, if you have breakfast a couple times a week, just eat your fucking Wonder Bread and, and enjoy it. There's no, there's no reason to get fancy toast, I think, for, for Plus, fancy bread for history, toast. Yeah. And its history is super racist. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there, I just dragged you down into the mud with us. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Think about that. <laughs> what Wonder, a- bread, Wonder Bread was created as a way to have like super w- pure white bread that didn't have like the stench of oh really of like what like racist Americans thought mm. they were like oh immigrants make our bread that's like dirty bread what if we made mm. white bread except to do it they like I mean I'm sure it's fine now but at yeah. the time to create white bread they just bleached it with all kinds of shit that was actually way more unsafe than the perfectly safe bread made that figures just you know by normal bakeries god nick we've got a lot of problems with your endorsement (laughs) nick's problematic endorsement yeah Yeah. Yeah. jesus sorry 
what was your what was your um what was your endorsement save going to be? My save was going to be uh, endorsing watching Jeopardy. Um, which, oh. but, but, but That's only, I, I will just briefly run through why, because uh, yeah. we've been watching no, Jeopardy not? recently for no particular reason. Um, and one of the things that occurred to Is us, because we had that shout out that honored that Jeopardy champion. Um, I don't yes. think so, but yes, yes. Uh, yes, yes, it yeah, was, yeah. yes, it was. <laughs> um, Nick just came in over the, <laughs> But uh, so Jean and I were watching Jeopardy, and and I was, I think she said like, I wonder if there's like a Jeopardy video game that we could play together and just like you know just have fun playing it as well as watching it. And I was like, okay, maybe. And I I Google Jeopardy video game. There is no like current version of a Jeopardy video game. However, <laughs> you can find on the Hamaker Schlemmer website the home oh, version of Jeopardy for five hundred dollars. You can oh you get God. a kit that plugs into your television and gives you four bu- or I, I guess three buzzers. I hope hopefully it's three, otherwise it's incorrect. Wow. Uh, and it's this like hilarious uh, like custom version of Jeopardy that just you know it's just plug and play, <laughs> uh, yeah. which is just uh, yeah it it cracked me up. The, of course Hamaker Schlemmer would have the the like insanely expensive you know, version yeah. of, of home jeopardy that is the only version of jeopardy you can buy right now i bet people buy that stuff because i'm oh, thinking yeah. now like when we were talking about hammock or slimmer and yeah. um and you and sharper image and all that stuff i was thinking like who would ever buy any of this like you mm-hmm. have to be so wealthy to have enough money to like i mean it's not like you it's it's not like you have to be outrageously wealthy to afford something that's five hundred dollars but you kind of do to spend five hundred dollars on something that pointless yeah you know or like that kind of on like a jeopardy cheap, home game i, I yeah. assume like i assume it's not actually like a beautiful object it's probably still just plastic crap mm-hmm. right Hand oh yeah carved um, walnut so, buzzers <laughs> right so like <laughs> right because that would end up being thousands of dollars yes right like the five hundred dollar version is definitely just going to be garbage so it's like who has the like disposable money to spend and then i re- i kind of just thought back to when I was in high school, I, I I may have mentioned this on one of our podcasts. I probably did, but I had a friend, and he was really great. He was like, like a math genius. But his father um, was the Juice Man from TV, Wait, like what? The infomercial Juice Man. If you guys ever yeah, Wait. you ever saw the Juice Man on infomercials? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that uh, for like for like some period of time. Um, his son went to my high school. Wait, and I went to their house oh, one wow. time. And it was this like, I mean, it's probably still to this day the most impressive house I've ever been. So, is in. your worldview that like everyone's probably friends with the guy whose dad is the Juice Man? Because that is not representative no. of America. What? Okay. Why, why would I, I like, claim that? Well, because you're like, I wonder who who buy, who are there enough people out there to keep these in business? Who <laughs> buys this? And then I remembered, well, my <laughs> friend, uh, his dad was the Juice Man. No, I just mean, I just, I'm just thinking of like who was pro like. Let's uh, assume that the juice man and, uh, kept him in business. Let's assume that it's his birthday soon. demise. No, that's not my and point. The, I'm just saying that, like, he'll be getting the, the Jeopardy home no, game. That's not, uh, no, I'm just saying <laughs> as a gift. I'm just saying I was trying to remember like the stuff they had in their house, and like, I mean, they had stuff like. Did you guys ever play like Dance Dance Revolution? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, they had like the pads for that and stuff. Like, like the they hard had, pads mm. or the soft mats? I don't remember, but I just mm. like, they just had stuff in their house. Yeah. That I'm going like, to assume it's like the hard ones, like the good yeah, ones. Yeah, maybe. They, I just remember they had stuff in their house that's like, oh, I, when I think back now, like, I didn't know other people who had, like, yeah. Just, it's not like everything they had was outrageously opulent, but it's like, oh, they had enough money that they could just, if they saw something like that, they could just buy it, right? Right, and it's no big deal. So, like, that's who's buying the yes. Jeopardy mm-hmm. at home thing. Because I, I remember and Nick Brecken, who secretly surely bought it and oh, is not admitting it? to it. No, right now. I did not buy it. <laughs> oh, he bought it. <laughs> right now, me calling Nick out on that means that he's gonna go and when the delivery shows up this afternoon, he's just gonna quietly throw it in the garbage <laughs> and never tell anyone that he bought it. <laughs> God, I had an experience the other day. Of being not the other day actually this was weeks ago at this point of being in a hotel bar and Jeopardy was on and I knew like every single answer to every question mm-hmm. and I was like man I should like go on Jeopardy I feel like Jeopardy's gotten more dumb I and think also it maybe has gotten easier and also Jeopardy I, I watched Jeopardy and Wheel of Fortune back to back because we were on in, uh, some restaurant bar I was in and it's just like. Jeopardy and Wheel of Fortune both feel like uh, 
what was the name of those DVD trivia games? Seen it. Those I've they feel it, like yeah. fucking seen it now. Where like a clip from a movie will play and that's the clue. Or right. like and it's just like <laughs> what does this famous character say? Or what is this character's name? And then it just shows Arnold Schwarzenegger saying Terminated. And you're like, oh, <laughs> the Terminator. Like I was yeah. fucking shocked yeah. by that. And maybe maybe I was watching sh- a weird I'm version sure of those shows. I'm sure that if I actually were to go on Jeopardy, I would get my ass handed to me. Like I'm sure Also that- it could just be that we're adults. I yeah. mean, that's when you're a it. teen the, or younger. They definitely the episodes definitely vary in difficulty. Some of the some episodes yeah, I'm like, oh my god, I, I know everything. In other episodes, yeah. I feel like a baby. Yeah, I'm sure that's okay. true. That's I'm sure true. if I actually watched Jeopardy regularly, it would not you would be the understand same. the arc of it. Yeah, but, it, but since, because I haven't actually watched Jeopardy, like Jake, to your point, because I haven't actually watched Jeopardy since I was in like actually just in a different phase of my life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the the difference was shocking. Yeah. Uh, it was just surprising. You should go on Jeopardy, Chris. I mean, I shouldn't actually go on Jeopardy. Uh, um, but anyway, those are our endorsements. Let's petition to get Chris Ramo on Jeopardy. <laughs> How do you even do that? Is that just like a thing? You can. You you can, you go, you you can the first you phase of it is just an online thing you do now. Oh, that's fine. Yeah, you take yeah. a thing online, and then if you pass that, I think you end up having to go down to the yeah. studio for something. The problem is, the problem is guaranteed. Like because I just said that. If I ever went on Jeopardy, Jeopardy, I would get so I would get oh, so yeah. fucking oh, demolished. Yeah. Like the Blitzer. laws of the universe would require that I just I, I I would just be destroyed, and I would look like an idiot. Yep. It would be a disaster. Yeah. The categories are sports, yeah. other things you don't <laughs> yeah, yeah, care about, yeah. things you hate to the point that you've avoided for ten years, <laughs> things you don't want to talk about on TV. <laughs> and the one category that'll make you feel good, but the last couple answers are the specific things about that category you don't know. And you're like, God, God what? damn it. Yeah. Yeah. Did you guys see that clip the about the nerds on Jeopardy who could answer every question on the board and then they got to the sports answer and not <laughs> one single person on Jeopardy knew any of the sports answers? God, good. Yeah, it was amazing. really, really good, but also that would be me. <laughs> like literally that would be me. I didn't know a single one. I didn't even know the one hundred dollar one or whatever the first one is, two hundred, whatever it is. Like I didn't know any of them. So I mean, I thought that clip was hilarious, but also secretly inside, uh, you're like, "Oh, that's that me." I would have been equally massacred. Yep. So whatever. Uh, also, Alex Trebek got really salty at all these nerds for not knowing any of the sports answers. Oh, Alex it Trebek is really, generally really good. A weird salty guy. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so that's good. I'm gonna, I'm gonna sort of like, I don't know if I have enough data or experience to second year endorsement, Nick, but I think I'm gonna go ahead and second year endorsement anyway. Sure. Um, all right. Well, that's it. That's it for this week's episode of Important If True. Thank you for joining us. Please send in your questions, your problems, your quandaries to questions at importantiftrue.com. If uh, if you think you need advice on something that is outside of our normal remit, fuck it. Go for it. Someone asked about getting glitter out of the carpet this week. so <laughs> And we turned it into like crayfish destroying the universe so I don't know whatever just send, send us just send, send us send your garbage in. send it to questions at importantiftrue.com and we will do our best if you do like this podcast consider recommending it to a friend it is so helpful when you do that our website is importantiftrue.com and you can give that to someone and then from there they can subscribe or get any of the information they need if you would like an ad free version of this podcast you can find it at patreon.com slash idle thumbs more information is there. And uh, I think that's all we have. I think that's it. Seems like y'all. it. Mm. Yep. That is, uh, there's no more for this episode of Important If True. So, for Idle Thumbs, I am Chris Remo. I'm Nick Brecken. I'm Jake Rodkin. We got 100,000 years left. Stay spicy. Of a thing you may want to re-record. It's one mm. tiny thing that you said. You said, I don't think Twista reproduces asexually. You're right. No, you're right. Twista is, I assume, not an asexually reproducing organism. He is, I assume, not an asexually reproducing organism. Twista is, I assume, not an asexually reproducing organism. Twista is, I assume, not an asexually reproducing organism. Yep, that all was right. all. Okay, thanks guys, that was particularly dumb.